Today, we're going to be looking at some game film and uh, listening to some testimony about Dolph Shanks. Shay's broke his wrist playing against Boston in the Eastern Division playoffs. Syracuse put the ball in play with number four Dolph Shays wearing a cast on the left arm taking the ball out of bounds. Again, like with the Bob Cousy video, we're going to be measuring it off of some criticism and commentary offered from the perspective of J.J. Redick. We'll be showcasing some of the, his commentary uh, as well as some other commentary from ESPN. And um, let's get right into it. So I watched the other day, I watched some film of Dolph Shays. Dolph Shays never shot more than 40% from the field. He was a sharpshooter back in the day. He shot 38% from the field every fucking year. And you're telling me that Kyrie Irving or T-Mac or Vince Carter weren't better basketball players than Dolph Shays? Honestly, like Kevin Love is better than probably 99% of the power forwards that made that list. <laughs> what player all time would you most want to play one-on-one? -on -one? I think he just doesn't know much about the players that made that list. I think that's the reality. You know, I did the math for how much footage exists of Dolph Shay's career. So there's just a few random baskets with a bias towards a couple of all-star game plays, a couple of playoff plays, um, and then there is one sort of 80% complete regular season game out there. And what that adds up to is 1% of 1% less, I'm sorry, less than 1% of 1% of Dolph Shay's career exists on film. So anything JJ or anybody else has seen are not true highlights. Dolph Shay's probably hit game winners. Dolph Shay's probably hit game winners to win playoff series. We don't get to see that stuff. JJ doesn't get to see that stuff. He doesn't get to see Dolph Shays truly being great. We just have sort of a random collection of clips that if assembled correctly, you can kind of squint your eyes and get the gist of how he, like some of the things he liked to do. And, you know, I'll do my best to show that. And I don't know how much of a deep dive JJ even did. Like, did he really even give himself an accurate picture of what Dolph Shays could do? I think if he did... I don't know that he'd be so harsh in judging him. Maybe he still would be, but we'll see. I answer that first. Do you mind if I answer that first? I'd want to play Dolph Shays first. <laughs> so I could beat his ass and be on the top 75 list. I mentioned that there is, there is an 80% complete game tape from a, the regular season of Dolph Shays. He scores 23 points this game. Um... We're gonna watch. We're gonna watch game tape of that, and I tracked some stats here, just so we can watch what kind of player he is. Uh, a lot of people know what kind of player, you know, and this is the kind of player that JJ, for example, says, um, you know, he would kick his ass, and then he would be on the top seventy-five list. I let's let's watch how Dolph Shays played basketball. Oh, and a couple of things about Dolph Shays first. Uh, I do have a little bit of biometric data from him. And the, that, that I think he was six foot seven and a half without shoes on. He was listed six eight for his career. So, and he was two hundred twenty pounds. That is the exact same size as uh, Aaron Gordon when Aaron Gordon was a rookie. I know Aaron Gordon has you know packed on muscle mass since then, but again, this era predates lifting weights. The stigma back then was, or the worry or concern back then was that if you trained your muscles and your strength. You could lose your shooting touch. A couple of players deviated from that and broke the mold for every, everybody. But Dolph Shays, to my knowledge, did not lift weights. And but he was a he was a big guy. He was six eight, two twenty. So six six seven and a half barefoot. That would he he could probably list six foot nine today, you know, or six foot nine in recent years, uh, whenever they would bump everybody's height up. So you know he was he was a he was a normal sized power forward. Left-handed runner, baseline, again, fakes right. Left-handed runner, baseline again. That's his second made field goal. Now he's going in right. Draws the foul. Two-handed set shot is his free throw. If you think his two-handed set shot was not a good shot, just know he shot 90, almost 91% for two seasons. I think it was 90.4% from the free throw line, shooting two-handed just like that. And those, both of those seasons, he shot almost 700 free throws for both of those seasons. 
So it's, it was no fluke. He had superlative shooting touch shooting that way. Actually, Dolph Shays practiced. Dolph Shays was a gym rat, which is why you're seeing those two left-handed shots. He shoot, he's shooting running jump shots or running... They're running jumpers with his left hand. The guy was a gym rat. He worked on every shot. He, he worked on them equally from both sides. And even his, even his long-range shooting, he's shooting with two hands, uh, which is why he was able to play with a cast. Like right there. Modern NBA three-point range. Great outlet. Great setup. Just showing some hustle on that play. Great off-ball movement. He's, he's, he's moving all around the court, and then he, which gets him the layup. This shot was way, whistled a charge from his teammate, but he made a right-hand jumper right there. Okay, gets the put back, puts it back with his left hand off the off the glass. Another good setup. He's initiating all his offense from three point range. By the way, good handoff. Another fake going left runner off balance. That's three already. Oh. Finishes with his left hand. Again. Draws a charge right there. I know they're sensitive, but he drew a charge. Oh my gosh, he's moving all over the place. Give and goes. Misses a left-handed sweeping hook right there. Another deep shot. Screen. Hand off. Going left, draws a charge. Great first step. That's a, That was against Johnny Green, one of the quicker players in the NBA. This initiates a steal right there. Uh, again, this was a jump ball. Great rebound in traffic. Another great rebound in traffic. Quick outlet passer. That was a skill that great big men had to have back then. That was a left-handed shot attempt into a free throw. Most of the clips are left-handed. In fact, that game that we just watched, he shot 8 for 17. Nine of those attempts, of those 17 attempts, were left-handed, and he made six of them. Actually, three additional drives that led to free throws were also left-handed. Let, let's watch a little bit more. That's not disrespect. Dolph Shays with his two-hand chest shot that shot 38%. Great. You were awesome in the 50s, bro. You were awesome. Congrats. No shade. And all I said was, we should absolutely celebrate the greatest players in every era. What they accomplished, who they were as players. We should celebrate that. But you can't tell me that but, you know, Dolph Shays was a better basketball player than Tracy McGrady or Kyrie Irving or Clay Thompson or Dwight Howard. It's, just, mm. it's not it's not based in any sort of fact. You know, since JJ keeps talking about percentages, I did want to talk about a few things here. Uh, right here, I have a, uh, a chart that shows field goal percentage versus shot distance. And it's basically showing that the closer you get to the basket, especially under five feet, when you get at the rim, Shooting percentages are between, you know, 65 and 75 percent. And there is a steep curve downwards where you start getting even five feet out. And at least in the 2000, 2001 era, you're dipping below 40 percent. I mean, even in the 2018, 2019, you're right at about 40 percent. And this is going to get into my other points that I'll try to make about Dolph Shays and Bob Cousy's era, the 1950s specifically. And some of this carries over into the 1960s as well as basketball became more of an enter... Before, before entertainment started to be, be woven into the game more. Because in the 1950s, the NBA was still a little bit of a purist sport in that it was trying to strictly adhere to rules and they weren't sure how to market the game as well as they as they grew to market the game over the years. And that included, you know, relaxing on certain rule enforcements, changing rules uh, just to keep the game 
entertaining for the fans. So finishing at the rim, as you see these high percentage plays here, I suspect that in the 1950s, not only were rim percentages lower, but the number of times players took shots at the rim was also lower. And this is again due to those rules like offensive fouls being so strict in that era. Getting to the rim was not easy in that era. Shot at 16-11. Sam Jones going down the middle, offensive foul. Frank Selby is guarding Havlicek. That's Ramsey going in. Another offensive foul charged to Ramsey. Jones. Heinsohn going in. An offensive foul charged to Heinsohn. As he rammed in LaRusso going in from the left side. So guarded by Wiley, feeds out to Heinsohn. LaRusso guarding him. And... Tommy Heinsohn again is charged with an offensive foul. From three-point range and onwards, you get more points per shot. So that is why everybody is spamming the three-point shot today. This did not exist in the 1950s. And therefore, everybody should be working the ball in close, as you can see right here. And by the way, this is only a modern metric. We actually don't know the points per shot uh, versus distance metric for 1950s basketball. For all we know, this early spike here that's about one point, you know, one almost 1.5 points per shot right at the rim, it might be down in the 50s. It might only be 1.2 points per shot in the 1950s. For all we know, because of other rules that were in place at the time, such as the sensitive charging calls. In the upper left-hand corner here, you're going to see a shot chart from the 1963 NBA Finals. Uh, this is from the Lakers side of things. And I want you to notice and remember that, you know, shots at the rim are the highest percentage shots, at least according to the modern format of the game. And I want you to notice how few shots are at the rim. And I want you to remember all those offensive foul calls and how it had, it basically shaped players to have to score on the baseline at the rim and come up with shots that were baseline at the rim, which again, if you remember, were around the 40% range for field goal percentage. In fact, all of these shots out here are 40% field goal type shots. And this is 1963. So everybody is shooting in the zone that even in modern basketball is 40%. It's about 40% out here. So why are we harping on these guys for their shooting ability when even today's players are also only shooting about 40% from this range, right? You know, and I think, again, the rules are playing a large part into why players aren't getting to the rim as often. Somebody like Bill Russell has no reason not to be getting at the rim all the time, and he shot 44% from the field. All right, so now let's look at, uh, again, there's a game, there's a almost a complete game. It's like an 80% complete game of Dolph Shays, and there's a couple of other game fragments that he played in. Uh, we're going to look at some of the, we're going to look at some of the violations that were committed on the floor from these games, and, you know, hopefully you guys will see. A lot of these turnovers and violations are, you know, you'd be pulling your hair out if you had to play basketball like this. Uh, I'm just trying to show how handcuffed these guys were. These are from actual, this is from actual Dolph Shays game tape. Offensive charge. That's an offensive foul because he hit him with his shoulder. And he's off ball at this point, but they call that a charge. That's another charge. Right here. The shooter. No, I didn't quite catch his jersey, jersey number there to know who that shooter is. I believe it was one of the forwards on the uh, Syracuse team. Richie Guerin, while on the run, draws a charge because the offhand, this is what I was talking about. Like Blake Griffin did this offhand over guys who were standing still in the paint. They were standing still, but he would dunk it. 
and there was no way those refs were going to blow that whistle. In this era, you could be on the run, and the defensive players on the run, the defensive players basically impeding your progress, and it's a turnover on you, and the ball goes the other way. That's a charge on you. This is whistled as traveling. Let's take a look. Catches. One, two. So one, two, pump fake, and then he goes up and he's uh, he's planted on two feet. So it's one, two, three, and they call it traveling. He would definitely have gotten that third step or that third hop after the after the pump fake today. No way would that get called, and and he'd be called for the foul as the guy's reaching across his shoulder. Okay, this play is just showing excessive contact by the defensive player into the back of the offensive player, and it is just whistled as out of bounds. Too much for Looney. Go through the steal and finish, and the foul. You don't want to add that. Uh, Richie Guerin's arm literally bounces off number 24's head as he's in his shooting motion. That would be free throws today. It's just, it's just out of bounds back then. And a missed field goal. So again, we're talking about field goal percentages here, right? That's a missed field goal. Okay, that was whistled as charging. I believe they think he backed into Johnny Red Kerr there. Is that Johnny Red Kerr? No, that's somebody else. That's a that's a forward. Red Kerr standing on the other side. Uh, so they just whistled that as an offensive foul because he jumped into the defender. So definitely no jumping into your defenders to bait them back then, especially in the paint. I, again, all these high percentage shots where they're getting in the paint, these are whistled as charges back then. No, this shot particularly won't count as a field goal that he missed, but how many times is he going to be like, okay, I can't get in there and take those shots. Let me settle for something that's one of these 40% shots or less that are out, you know, in that mid range. And there's no strong incentive to shoot from deep. So here's another one. Now I think he gets the ball. Oh yeah, he does by 22. He gets the ball poked out of his hands. Oh, he gets fouled here, but they call it a charge on him as he runs into Dolph Shays. Dolph Shays is moving his feet. Yeah, Dolph Shays is moving his feet. And it's a charge on Richie Guerin. Outrageous. How are you supposed to get high percentage shots at the rim? If everything, every time you go into the rim, it's a charge. What is this one? Johnny Kerr taps it, does not have control yet, taps it, collects it, one, two, three, shot, traveling. One, two, three, the third, the third is a hop off of two steps, shot, traveling. They're not calling that today. Okay, here's another. So, dribble, one, let's see. They would count the gather like right here. Way back here they would count the gather today. So one, one, two, and then a pivot. Just get back to a good percentage and be willing. That can unlock a lot. And he does work on it quite a bit, you know. We'll listen to some other people talk about Dolph Shays here. And this is why I don't particularly like J.J. Reddick's commentary on players that he really doesn't know much about that are historical basketball players is he he's basically opening the door for other journalists and analysts to start talking crap about players that played in the past that they know nothing about as well. I, I just don't think it's good form. I don't think it's good entertainment or certainly it's not quality entertainment. I'll just put it that way. Um, these players are a lot better than these guys are about to give him credit for. So let's listen to their 
opinion. Of course, JJ Reddick sees Dolph Shays and is like, that could have been me in mm-hmm. very no. real terms <laughs> oh, yeah. had I existed in that era. He's on my block, a, right? A, He's on my there block. There was a tweet of that. There was that 38%. There was a tweet of Jimmy's, uh, JJ's quote, and uh, somebody followed it up with, JJ doesn't want this smoke, and it's Dolph uh, Shays highlights, and it's just 20 footers with the entire arena just staring at him, nobody closing out, and it's just like swish. And he's like sweeping hook shots where you know he missed five of those right before that, but they caught the video on the one, and it's just like, man. No, he's not missing a ton of, again, the difference between Dolph Shea shooting 38% and a player shooting, you know, 48%, a modern field goal percentage is the modern players are shooting 10 for 20, Dolph Shea is shooting eight for 20. He has modern NBA three, three point range, even though there is no three point shot. So again, with the points per shot not being inflated from that range like to today, why is he even shooting that far out? I think because he, of very few players, when he shoots that far out, he's still shooting in that 40% ballpark. You know, his field goal percentage is 40%. I think he shoots 40% from anywhere on the floor. I think that's why he's able to stretch the floor like that. Again, players were not getting to the rim like they do today. Uh, he, all of his drives, he's he's not necessarily getting to the rim. I think I saw one backdoor play where he was at the rim. The rest of his shots um, that were counted as field goals or field goal attempts, uh, they were runners from the baseline. I think Dolph Shays shoots roughly 40% from anywhere on the floor. Therefore, players had to guard him from anywhere on the floor. That's why he was considered a sharpshooter in his time. Is you you had to you had to guard him way out, even though he's a power forward. So again, I mentioned he was a gym rat. He was the guy. I mean, I, I have newspaper articles that literally say he just like testimony about Kobe that he's usually in the gym long after everybody else leaves uh, that's on the team practicing. So here we see the fruits of that labor. He has got he has got one of the best off hands. Like, I mean, there's only a little bit of footage. Like I said, 1% of 1% of his career. It's not highlights. It's not true highlights. It's just random clips. And of the random clips, most of the clips are left-handed. In fact, that game that we just watched, he shot eight for 17. Nine of those attempts, of those 17 attempts, were left-handed, and he made six of them. Actually, three additional drives that led to free throws were also left-handed. You know, he was going left some, you know, sometimes more often than he was going right. So th- these are all his left-hand shots here. Again, runner. Nice big stride on the way to the hoop. That's a left-handed jump shot. That was just that was just a face-up jump shot. Let's look at that again. Over 19, number 19. I believe number 19 right there. I believe that's Walter Dukes. Seven footer. He shoots a left-handed jump shot over a seven footer. Remarkable. That's just a jump shot with the wrong hand. Fakes, goes left off the glass. Beautiful. Another jump shot over another seven footer. That was over Ray Felix. Left hand pass. No problem. Again, this is that left handed off the off the backboard. Oh, runner into the lane, left handed. Another fake. Another runner. Jeez. Left handed in traffic. Oh my gosh. In triple threat. <laughs> Left handed off the glass. Great first step. He's got a great first step. <laughs> the Left handed finish. Even on the right side, he's finishing with his left hand. Nice pass from Bob Cousy. Like the, those old school days are just so frustrating to watch. All these guys did, all they did was be the best in their profession at their time. <laughs> That's all, all you can do. The best, and yet they the, lived long enough to be terrible. <laughs> they were the best anyone. Oh, man, 
live long enough to be terrible. Uh, how many players today are shooting left-handed shots like Dolph Shays? How many players today shoot 91% from the free throw line? From the field, his 38% is a different game. That's a different game. And yet he's driving in on the left. I mean, that was his creative solution was, I'm going to get baseline shots right or left-handed. Remarkable. What Dolph Shays was doing is remarkable back then. It's remarkable even today. Match every shot they take right-handed, they can do it left-handed. Inter interchangeably during the course of a game. You know, everybody hypes up Larry Bird for having that one game where he sh took nine left-handed shots. You know, like I said, I have just this one random game of Dolph Shays, completely random, not a great game by Dolph Shays. He only scores 23 points, and he makes six left-handed shots in that game. Attempts nine of them. Attempts 12 of them, if you count the 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 shots that shot attempts that aren't marked as field goal attempts because he went to the free throw line. But there are caveats that are important in the historical record because I've just Wikipedia Dolph Shays to respect his legacy. And there is one sentence that I want to read for you guys. Quote, this is about his NBA career. Early in Shay's career, he broke his right arm and played almost an entire season in a cast. <laughs> I mean, am I taking crazy pills here? Not that long ago, players like Kobe would play through injuries. And I mean, I it's a respectable trait. And the fact that Dolph Shays shoots his outside shots like this, that enabled him to play in a cast on either hand because he could shoot with his fingertips with both hands. And then the fact that he was so proficient with his offhand, I mean, remarkably proficient. I actually think he probably didn't miss much of a beat having a cast on one hand or the other. All right, so what can we conclude here? Dolph Shays was one of the first power forwards or big guys, you know, 6'8", 220, would list probably 6'9", in more recent eras and would probably weigh upwards of 240 plus if he lifted weights. One of the first big guys that could shoot from outside, way outside, modern NBA three-point range. Even though it was only worth two points, he shot that way to open up his drive. So he was a dynamic player. He was not a spot up guy. He was always initiating offense. He had to be a remarkably good shooter to effectively space the floor like that without the three point incentive. Uh, he was probably matching his field goal percentage of up close shots even that far out. So he's probably shooting a modern three point percentage, you know, upper 30s in percentage. Great first step. He's not a great athlete by modern standards. Um, his vertical jump is not great. Uh, I don't have any clips of him dunking. I have no doubt that he could dunk. I know his max vertical reach was over 11 feet as per some newspaper articles. We just don't have enough footage. We have 1% of 1% of his career, which is a shame. It's, it's kind of what is expected from 1950s players. But the limited, the small glimpse that we have, he is probably one of the most ambidextrous players that I've ever seen. I mean, in any era. I see Kyrie make so many left-handed finishes today, and I'm just like, wow, it blows my mind. And uh, there are mixes of Kobe taking such a variety of left-handed shots, and those blow my mind. And then the Larry Bird left-handed game, that blows my mind. But I think Dolph, considering how limited the footage is, the, the footage availability is of Dolph Shays, Dolph Shays might take the cake as one of the most impressive left-handed players, uh, uh, right-handed players shooting with their left hand that I've ever seen. Just on the frequency and the level of difficulty of those shots. It looks like he's left-handed. If you look at him, if you just look at his left-handed shots, it looks like he's a left-handed player. He's literally shooting face-up, square-up jump shots left-handed. So, do I think a player like JJ is going to be able to time travel and take his place on the top 75 list Let's even imagine he does understand the rules and he adjusts. Does he take Dolph Shay's spot? I'll let you guys decide. So that. I could beat his ass and be on the top 75 <laughs> list. Because Dolph Shay's never shot more than 40% from the field. He was a sharpshooter back in the day. He shot 38% from the field every fucking year. That's not disrespect. My bread and butter was a great outside shot and a drive to the basket. If I set my outside shot, the player would come up on me, and that's what I wanted him to do. 
try to stop me from shooting from outside. Then when he came up on me, I go by. I will say that he was really kind of a special player. Shays, you had to guard him all over the court because he was capable of, of shooting from any place and being accurate. Don Shays is an interesting individual because I saw him play long before I met him. And I saw him play one game and uh, actually he, he had maybe broken his hand, his right hand shooting hand or something, but I had a cast on him. He started shooting left-handed. But he was the first guy I saw big man shoot the ball from outside. He moved constantly on the floor and it was a tremendous asset for Syracuse Nats. I um, mean, Don Shades was well known around the league, was very, very, very tough to handle, very, very, very tough to defend against. Very simple, very effective, and that's all you need in basketball, a couple of simple things to make you a, a, a great player. All back is in my ear, you get on this guy, he's an old guy, he's been around a long time, you shut him down. Okay. He takes two steps past the half court line and puts the ball in both hands and fires up a set shot. Nothing but net. Don Shay shooting, bullseye. Oh my God, this guy's great. I was one of the first power forwards, which meant that I was able to take bigger men outside. And with my movement, you know, game, basketball is a game of movement. So I move, and I move continuously. A power forward who can shoot and do it all. That's today's talk. Don Shays did that. 60 years ago. He played all 15 of his NBA seasons with our franchise. He was a 12-time All-Star. He brought the franchise its first ever title in 1955. He was enshrined in the Hall of Fame in 1973. And here's a story I just heard tonight. One year playing in the NBA, he broke his right arm. He played the entire season with a soft cast on his right arm, played the entire year with his left hand. Shays okay, broke his wrist playing against Boston in the Eastern Division playoffs. And he was an all-star that year. This is a man who changed the game. He revolutionized the game of basketball. Truly one of the greats. NBA 50 all-time players, 12-time all-star, six-time all-first NBA player, career 18 and 12 guy, and the only thing better than him as a basketball player was Dolph Shays the man. The left-handed 20-foot running hook shot over Nikola Jokic. When people talk about Kyrie Irving being the most skilled player ever, and I'm not here to debate that that day, or debate, debate that today, but when people talk about that, it's because of moments like this. The confidence to shoot that shot and have it go in is just insane. From 1948 to 1964, in his 16-year career, he led the team into the postseason 15 times. In 1970, he was elected to the NBA's 25th anniversary team as one of the top 12 retired players. To be in the same, not only group, but in the same building with uh, with uh, uh, Larry Bird, my hero, and, and, and Michael Jordan, and Bill Russell, and uh, Jabbar, uh, Magic, you know, I mean, and, and to be part of that, I mean, that, that was heady stuff.